After discussing uh, read-only memories, now we're going to move on to the interesting case of dynamic RAM. So ROMs are very limited in usage. ROMs can only be used for data that is number one written during manufacturing, and number two can only be read. OTPs, the one-time programmable memories, can be configured after manufacturing, but still, they only can be uh, programmed once. How can we make a high density, i.e. high capacity memory, that can be used for both reading and writing? Well, the answer to that is to go dynamic. So the Intel 1103 used a uh, 3T DRAM cell. In fact, Intel was initially, you know, a DRAM company. So you can see the um, Intel 1103 over here. And uh, what we have here is a M1, which is a write transistor, and M2 and M3, which are a read port. And what we would do is store our data on this parasitic capacitor or on this capacitor that was built purposely called CS. So what you do over here is you put your data either 1 or 0 on this bit line over here. And then you use your write word line to open up this M1 over here, and then you get your data, either a 1 or a 0, over here onto CS. Once it's over there, you either have a 1 or a 0 over here. Um, M2 is either on or off, depending if you had a 1 or 0 on X over there. And then what we're going to do is we're going to pre-charge our bit line, and we're going to um, access our read word line, so that's going to turn on, and then if this is a 1, we're going to discharge our word line. If it's a 0, our word line is, our uh, bit line, excuse me, is not going to be Discharge. So that can be seen over here in um, the waveforms that we have below here. The advantages of this is that there are no constraints on device ratio. We really have this decoupled read. So we have the write applied to the M1, and we have M2 and M3 doing the read, and they're completely decoupled from each other. So we can make uh, M2 and M3 basically as large as we want without impeding the write, and we can make M1 as large as we want without impeding the read. We can also use all kinds of different VTs and so forth and so on. So it really has this decoupled read, and it also means that reads are non-destructive. So uh, similar to SRAM, we can write to a cell, and then we can read from the cell as many times as we want without uh, destroying the data. On the other hand, we have the disadvantage that data leaks away over time. So again, we have charge that's stored inside this capacitor. It'll run away into some different directions that we have over here. And uh, it's a dynamic cell. I mean, there's no connection to VDD or ground that's going to replenish it um, once we lose the data here. So we have to refresh it every once in a while. The other thing is that we have a weak one stored on X because we only used a regular pass transistor going over here and not a uh, complementary pass gate. And the other thing is that we have single single-ended read operation, so we're reading out through a single bit line versus reading out through differential bit lines as we did in SRAM, which was really nice to have, you know, speed and robustness of the read operation. Here's a layout of the 3T DRAM, and what we can do here is we can see we can route our read word line and our uh, write word line in, you know, poly uh, layers, and then we can um, route our bit lines in, you know, something like metal 2 and have the internal connections in metal 1. Okay, so um, uh, that's how we can kind of do this type of a layout. And again, you can play around with it according to the de design rules you have. But um, the disadvantage over here is that we have a lot of contacts. And we saw already that contacts um, cause us to have a larger bit cell. And it's really dominated by contacts in this 3T DRAM. So the question is if we can go even smaller than that, and the answer is yes. Remember our friend Denard with our, his Denard scaling model? Well, I had mentioned back then that Denard invented the, um, the, the DRAM, and indeed in, in 1967 he pan patented a one transistor cell. So this is uh, the cell over here. What we have here is our word line again and our bit line, as we've had in all of the different structures that we've shown um, up till now, and we just have this one transistor, which is both a read port and a write port. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is we're going to dynamically store data inside our cell. So we're going to either put VDD or um, GND on our bit line, and then we're going to enable our word line, and then we're either going to get, you know, VDD minus VT over here if we wrote a 1, or we're going to get 0 over here if, uh, if we wrote ground. Um, then what we're going to do is we're going to store VDD, we're going to pre-charge VDD over 2 onto the bit line over here. Again, enable our word line, and um, we're going to have charge uh, uh, sharing between, you know, this small capacitor CS and this large capacitor CBL. 
And um, what's going to happen here is because CBL is much bigger, CBL is going to go down by a bit if we have zero here, but by passing charge from itself onto CS. So CS will um, go up to, you know, uh, to whatever this uh, VDD over 2 minus delta is. Uh, VDD over 2 minus delta, or if uh, we had a, if we had a VDD minus VT over here, CBL is going to go up a bit to VDD over 2 um, plus delta. So those are the two options we have, and what we need to do then is connect some sort of a sense amplifier that can make out the difference between, you know, uh, if we went VDD over 2 plus delta or minus delta over here, and that is by charge sharing. And one of the means to get that is we need to have a as large a CS as possible in order to actually make this differentiation, or else we're not going to be able to tell the difference. Okay, so that's how the um, readout is done. But again, we were able to do this with only a single transistor and a capacitor. So the charge sharing shows us that delta V is going to be, you know, V bit line minus V pre-charge, and it's going to be V bit minus V pre times CS over CS plus CBL, and we have to have CS be as large as possible to enable to have a difference that we can actually read out. The drawbacks of this are, first of all, that we have that same week one that's stored on CS, we, we get, you know, VDD minus VT. The second thing is charge sharing is slow and we get a small delta that is going to be hard to read out. And something that we um, didn't ever see before is that read is destructive. So once we did that, we, we initially started with a zero over here, but then we're going to have, you know, our VDD over two minus delta, or we started with a VDD uh, minus VT over here, but we're going to finish with VDD over two minus delta. So we lost our data. So what we have to do is we have to write back immediately after reading out. We have whatever we wrote, um, read, we're going to have to write it back into this into the cell after reading it. So that's called a destructive read operation. So let's see about the 1T, 1C, one transistor, one capacitor DRAM cell, which is what really we have um, making the main memory of all our computers today. So um, you could use a standard process, which means you want to make this big capacitor, right? That CS capacitor we want to be big. So we can make it with some sort of a poly capacitor over here. However, that's going to be really, really expensive in area. So even though that was a popular thing to be done maybe in the 70s and 80s, um, it, it really is big and it wasn't worth it. You can't get a very high density. So the alternative is to make a stacked capacitor where we would go up on top of our cell and then make these, you know, uh, like radiators on top, which have, which uh, create a large capacitance. So that is called a um, stacked capacitor. And again, you cannot do that in a standard, um, you know, in a standard process in a, a regular logic fab. You have to have a special process. The other way to do it, which is also very common, is called a trench capacitor. In this case, we dig a big, big, deep trench underneath you know, our transistor, um, and we fill it with a conductor, insulator conductor, and we get a very large capacitor. And again, it, both of these um, systems are used. Uh, some fabs use, some fabs for DRAM and for embedded DRAM use a um, stacked capacitor, and some use a trench capacitor, but both of them cannot be done uh, and integrated very well with a standard CMOS process. They're a special type of a, uh, of a process that does this. Um, what about the sense amplifier? So we use what we call a latch-based sense amplifier. It's similar to what we saw for SRAM in one way or another, but remember, we're going to have this, uh, you know, single-ended um, readout over here. So this is the uh, latch, okay, and we're going to get, you know, um, we're, we're going to have this SRAM cell over here that is going to be disabled uh, because the SE is um, turned off. And what we're going to first do is we're going to initialize it at its metastable point by raising the EQ, um, uh, the EQ signal and equalizing the, the two sides of the uh, sense amplifier. Then um, once, uh, then we're going to uh, allow the bit line and the bit line bar to charge or discharge and um, then we're going to enable the sense amplifier and the sense amplifier is going to basically take our SRAM cell and pull it either to um, one or to zero on the two sides and give us this large voltage difference. Now, um, there are a couple of questions over here how this is, you know, how this affects us. Um, one thing that we want to point out is that once we do pull it to its full rail to rail swing, which is something that we, we did not want to do with standard 60 SRAM, we actually wanted to cut off these bit lines when we were sensing so we wouldn't 
waste the power of you know uh, discharging or charging that huge uh, BL capacitance. You know we had a big CBL, and that was a lot of um, that was a lot of power. In this case, though, what we need to do is we need to write back. So we are going to discharge or charge the bit line all the way to VDD or ground, and then just by leaving the word line inside the cell uh, on, we're going to write back whatever uh, it is we read out. So that is our write back, which is able is how we are able to deal with um, uh, with uh, the destructive read operation. The other thing is uh, I write here a bit line and bit line bar, but in fact we have a single ended readout. We don't have the two of them. So there are different ways to do this. We can either just you know use like the the other bit line is something that's uh, substantially at the VDD over 2 at the starting point and then we can just feel the difference it went, it went up to delta or under delta or we can actually take a dummy row a replica row or like a row that's not accessed from the other side of the array or something and use that as our other bit line so both of those ways are um, done often to uh, give us this differential readout which is much much more robust than other types of single-ended readout the DRAM architecture is something that's very interesting and important for computer architects. I am just going to uh, briefly tell you about it just so you can see it, but it's something that if you're going to ever use DRAM um, at a higher level uh, of, uh, of, you know, of uh, addressing and uh, and, uh, and programming a computer, you should have heard of it before. So what we do is we have a DIM. A DIM is this dual inline memory module, and um, you can see here that it's a bunch of these uh, chips that are um, that are on one of these boards that we stick inside our computer. Uh, and uh, the DIM has two ranks. The ranks are the sides of the DIM. So we're going to have you know eight chips over here. These are eight DRAM chips, and we're probably going to have eight on the other side to increase the amount of memory that we're able to put on to one of these uh, types of uh, boards. Okay, so each of these ranks, and again, the ranks is this set of eight chips on one side, which has 64 bits of IO. Um, it's gonna have eight chips, and each chip is gonna have, for instance, one gigabyte of, uh, of DRAM on it. Okay, so um, now each of these chips, since there are eight of them, each of them gets eight of the uh, IO bits, is going to have what we call b eight banks inside. Um, so there are going to be 120 megabytes per each bank of DRAM on, on one of these chips. And each of the banks is going to be one bit. So in fact, we're going to read out one of the bits, one of the 64 bits or whatever that we're going to be passing, or one of the 128 bits that we're going to be passing over to our uh, main chip in the end from a, sync, from a whole bank, which is 128 megabytes. So out of 128 megabytes, we want to read out one bit. Uh, so these banks are divided into eight arrays. The arrays are 16 megabytes each. Okay, and the arrays are divided into about 128 mats. Mats were, are, for example, 1024 by 1024 bits. So we have 1024 rows um, with 1024 uh, columns is one subarray, um, which is called a mat. And that uh, makes an 128 or so of those make up an array. Okay, uh, uh, eight arrays make up a bank, eight banks make up a chip, eight chips make up a rank, and two ranks make up a DIM. Okay, so to access the DRAM, we actually do it with two operations. The first operation that comes from the main computer, uh, the, the DDR controller, um, it's going to give what we call a RAS, a row access strobe, which is the first uh, operation. It's going to send, you know, its whole address over to the DRAM, but only the address of the row. And what, what we need here is 10 bits out of that, which is 1,024, um, to select one out of 1,024 rows. So out of these 1,024-bit uh, uh, row mats, we're going to select one row out of them. But we're going to get a lot of them. We're going to get about 128 of these 1,024-bit uh, rows that are going to be read out. And so we're going to take uh, another seven bits from, that are going to select um, only one out of these 128 rows that are right now stored inside our sense amplifiers. And these guys are going to be stored in what we call a bank row buffer. So we're going to have a total of 1,024 bits that are stored inside our bank row buffer. And again, this is for one bank. Remember, out of one bank, we only need to provide one bit. So um, inside this chip, one of the banks is going to have, you know, 1,024 bits that are stored in the bank row buffer, and we need to multiplex out one of them to the output from the chip that's going to go all the way to our main computer. Okay, so for that, we have a second operation, which is called a CAS or a column access strobe that comes from the computer, and it's going to say, okay, out of those 
um, 1024 bits, which is the one that we want, and it's going to select that one from the row buffer to the bank output. This is an important thing because um, we don't actually uh, go and do this for every bit that we select or for every word that we select. We um, repeat this process. Uh, we try to order the accesses so that we'll already use what is stored inside our bank row buffer so we don't have to go and access the DRAM again and again. This is something that uh, computer architects deal with all the time. Node is embedded DRAM. So DRAM, as I said, requires a special dedicated process. So there are only several fabs in the world that actually do this. Micron, Samsung, and SK Hynix are the main fabs that exist uh, nowadays that actually fabricate uh, DRAM. And again, it's in a different fab, a completely different fab than what we um, make our process, uh, our regular processes in, uh, which, you know, TSMC, we've discussed plenty of times during this uh, lecture series, who are the, the leading one in the world. Um, they, they supply these DRAMs on a separate standalone chip. It is not the same chip as it has our processor and so forth on it. However, there is such a thing as an embedded version, embedded DRAM, which means it's on the same chip, EDRAM. Okay, but EDRAM means that we have to have spe uh, special additional um, uh, additional masks, so they're called cost adders to our process that enables to, uh, to fabricate this. IBM um, used this for a very long time in what was called a trench capacitor, and uh, IBM, along with Global Foundries, makes them up to a 14 nanometer process nowadays. Um, Intel, uh, up to, I think, a 22 nanometer process, makes them with a, you know, metal insulated metal, metal uh, one of these uh, um, stacked capacitors, um, so they have it in, in, in a 22 nanometer process. But uh, EDRAM has been um, continually hard to fabricate in, in more recent processes and it's uh, something that, it, it, that you don't find in many processes today and it, it adds a lot of cost to your whole process. So recent chips that have been shown with, you know, um, EDRAM that's been used as a level four cache. So the Intel Broadwell came with a separate chip, as you can see here, which is 128 megabytes on one, uh, one adjacent chip, but it's not exactly embedded because it's actually on a separate chip that's packaged in the same uh, package along with the um, main processor die. Um, the IBM, however, has a pair of chips that are called the Z15, and their um, SC chip, which is one of the two, actually has as much as 960 megabytes of this embedded DRAM in a 14 nanometer process that's on the same chip as some of their other control stuff. So that's the biggest one that's been, um, that, that's actually the biggest on-chip uh, memory other than um, some crazy stuff like wafer scale engines by Cerebrus that have been, um, uh, that have been fabricated till now. Uh, another thing is gain cell embedded DRAM, and the reason I'm telling you about this is because a lot of my research has been um, focused on this in recent years. So um, what, uh, the thing about EDRAM, it's not logic compatible. That means that we cannot make it in the same uh, standard, you know, vanilla um, CMOS process as we make our other um, logic. So we need to add these process adders, and they're very expensive, and it's actually not available for most processes. I wouldn't say that it's not available for many processes. For most processes, you cannot get embedded DRAM and no one's shown it under 14 nanometers yet. So the question is, why not go back to the old Intel DRAM that I showed you before? And in fact, that you can use the parasitic capacitance of the gate and of the diffusion, and even of some MIM caps that you build up with metal layers and so forth, in order to uh, create this parasitic um, uh, capacitor. And we actually, um, as opposed to DRAM, the regular 1T1C DRAM, where we did charge sharing, in this, in this case, we have you know, the read stage over here, which has gain. So we have this transconductance that goes from the storage node over to the read bit line that is gain on the, this thing and we can read out very small voltages that we actually store over here. We call this gain cell embedded DRAM because of the gain that's over here and we have um, different versions from two transistors to four transistors. They gain um, in density as opposed to SRAM but they're SRAM alternatives because they're completely embedded on chip in standard logic processes and there are other uh, options that have more than four transistors or different types of um, uh, configuration with diodes and so forth that have other types of uh, usages. So um, our group has shown the, the, the most scale demonstrated uh, GCE DRAMs and here are a bunch of papers from uh, TCAS1, from uh, the journal Solid State Circuits and the Solid State Circuit letters in recent years showing um, uh, these types of DRAMs working in 28 nanometers, in 28 nanometer FDSOI and in 60 nanometer processes. So that was what I had to say about dynamic RAM, and next we'll be going over some of the non-volatile memory technologies.